Enjoy. Welcome to the first episode of the LPP podcast. LPP is the Life Process Program, an online, non-12-step addiction treatment option. Dr. Stanton Peel developed the Life Process Program out of his own work, and he refined it over several years of operation in a prestigious CARF accredited residential rehab. Now LPP is available completely online and is accessible for people around the world. So every episode of this podcast will be about how the program works, and we will offer tips about how to apply information from the program into your own life so that you can try it out for yourself. Today's show will offer some of that, but we'll need to give you a little background, and to help me with that is the creator of the Life Process Program himself, Dr. Stanton Peel. Good morning, Stanton. Good morning, Zach. Good to be here with you. So we want to offer this podcast as a tool that people can use to help themselves or help their loved ones who are battling addiction or maybe other kinds of life problems. And I think before we can launch into that kind of knowledge share, we have to orient people with the program itself. So will you give a little bit of background about LPP and how it began and how it works? Well, for some time I've been aware that you can't define addiction in terms of a substance. You can't say well, heroin creates addiction. Um, addiction resides in that object. That addiction is a relationship an individual has with a certain experience in a given setting. And so my focus for quite a long time, really starting with Love and Addiction in 1975, but also in my book with Archie Brodsky and Mary Arnold, The Truth About Addiction and Recovery, where we outlined the life process program, it describes a way of embedding addiction in your overall life space. And that therefore, the best way to address addiction is by addressing those elements in your life space. I I would like to point out You and I have had several discussions where the idea that addiction is caused by a drug is now so broadly accepted that even drug policy reformers focus on things like medicine-assisted treatment or on reducing the supply of prescription painkillers. And the data are fairly clearly in over the last five years, uh, the result of reducing the availability of prescription painkillers has been to sharply increase the number of drug-related deaths, both with painkillers and with heroin, uh, but also with coke, meth, and uh, benzodiazepines. At the same time, the areas where MAT has been most concentrated, urban areas, have seen a, a likewise sharp increase in heroin deaths. Uh, Whenever data analysis is performed, we find that the people who are dying are towards the later end of middle age prior to being senior citizens, maybe 35 to 55. And so that belies the idea that what we're looking at is overdose, which would be a matter of, which would be more common among young and new users. Instead, it's the accumulated effects of possibly drugs, but overall health and life factors that end in people dying. And so we're really looking at the wrong place and we're looking and we can't let go of that bit. And so as a result, we're seeing an acceleration in negative outcomes. The Life Process Program has the concept that it's a, it's a very ambitious thing to imagine remedying the kinds of populations uh, who tend to be men, uh, less well-educated, single, lacking community in both inner cities and rural poor areas. Uh, To address those problems, we need some kind of cultural shift that we're just not only incapable of producing, but we don't seem to want to produce it. We don't seem to want to focus on that. And so the Life Process Program is a mini version of creating that kind of change in a person's life. When you think of those people, those high-risk populations, they lack a purpose in their lives. 
They lack community and an ability to form relationships. They lack life skills for dealing with emotions. They lack education often and training and employment. And so the Life Process Program takes those elements of a person's life and makes it their fo the focus. Now, I'm not claiming that the Life Process Program mainly recruits the kinds of people who are dying. It's, uh, it's likely that our population is somewhat more upscale than that. But the fundamentals remain. Um, the way that people avoid and overcome addiction is by attending to the critical elements in their overall life, both, you might say, within themselves, including their emotional state, and also their outside relationships, their connections, their connectivity to things like work, society, purpose, and community. And that's how we approach addiction and other related emotional problems in LPP. There's so much competing for our attention. I think one of the reasons that we cling to the stories we tell ourselves that are obviously not working is that we sort of have to reduce things to stories. And one of the reasons the disease model is so appealing is because despite not being completely justified, it's an easy story to tell, and it covers a lot of the top questions that people have about addictions. Um, but obviously it's not working. What works about LPP? What works about getting people to talk about their own values and goals and motivations and what helps them achieve something greater than what they get from their current experience or their even their current addiction experience? Why sign up for a program instead of just writing in a journal? Well, uh, we, we don't discourage self-cure. And in fact, we emphasize in life process program and in my work that people generally get better on their own, but that can be an evolved process and it can take some length of time. We, we know that the median length of time to overcome cigarette dependence is 24 years, alcohol 16. It's somewhat less for illicit drugs. And so we're taking them in LPP on a guided tour of actual recovery, self-initiated recovery by fanning those flames. As your question points out, the need is for them to take a hold of their own cure. And that's true, obviously, in any form of treatment, just as true at the Betty Ford Clinic, where you can spend a month or two months or three months, but then you're going to have to live your life. In the Life Process Program, which we do on, a internet, on the internet, to put it mildly, it's an outpatient program, obviously, the responsibility and initiative uh, comes from the individual. Uh, and so we use motivational interviewing techniques and we focus on self-efficacy. Um, you and I, of course, are writing a book called Outgrowing Addiction, Using Common Sense Instead of Disease Therapy. One highlight in there is that SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which over its life has emphasized the disease of addiction, did a very comprehensive survey of mental health and addiction experts to define recovery. And they came up with four main pillars, health, home, purpose, and community. But more important than that, underlying their whole approach is the idea that it's a self-initiated process and a self-maintained process. So the Life Process Program is a way of creating help which allows the individual, that encourages the individual's self-efficacy and to be in charge of their own recovery. Some of the way that you just identified your definition of addiction should lead one to understand that it's certainly not reliant on being addicted to only drugs. The important... The traditional notion of addiction, which has been disproved, is that there's some specific component in the chemical that causes addiction. We know that's not true. There is no such thing as in heroin or opioids that causes addiction. Um, among other reasons, I mean, there's so much data to show that, but at 
first we defined only narcotics as addictive, and then we immediately expanded that to include cocaine and marijuana. Um, and there is no common chemical mechanism that crosses all of those drugs. And so they've started to talk about, well, reward mechanisms in the brain. But as soon as you get that general, the reward mechanisms they describe cover just about everything human beings do that produce rewards, sex and food, um, minor, what we some people consider minor pleasures like shopping, anything that can create some kind of a sensation of reward and a feeling of engagement and involvement with something that produces that reward, but it's linked externally. It's caused by some kind of an involvement, which is always going to be temporary. Um, every one of the drugs, alcohol, sex, love, shopping, video games, are all dependent on a specific state that is outside of you and induced by an external relationship. So drugs are highly satisfactory elements of addiction because they produce immediate and predictable sensations that people see. But that doesn't mean that there's something about the chemical that is in and of itself addictive. And so we now understand that we're talking about a broader pool of activity. And that's so widely under recognized now that both DSM-5, the diagnostic, the current diagnostic manual of the American Psychiatric Association, and ICD-11, the International Classification of Diseases, no longer use the term addiction in regards to drugs. It's just not defining enough about one set of drugs against another. And ironically, the word addiction is now, for example, in DSM-5, only applied to a non-disease activity. So from the start, obviously, I wrote a book with Archie Brodsky called Love and Addiction in 1975. And as we said then, addiction can't be defined in regards to a specific substance or chemical reaction. That's, that's, under, that's understood universally now. And we're looking at a broader kind of a process, which some people call process addiction. They often mean by that, well, you can get addicted to eating or sex or love. But really, what we're looking at is that addiction undergoes a set process where people become engaged in an engulfing kind of an activity in order to fulfill essential human needs that simultaneously has the effect of making people less capable of fulfilling those needs other than through the addictive activity until they become wholly dependent on activity as a center sometimes of their entire lives and beings. So here we have the foundation for the program um, on your end. And obviously I agree with you. I'm a, happily a coach in the program. Um, we've, as you say, written a book together about addiction and development, how those things are not so different. In fact, they're intricately linked. So we thought we were going to have maybe explore a little bit. You thought maybe I could offer some insight to you, and we have not exactly prepared this, but since I am a coach in the program, since I've undergone my own addiction experience, you were thinking that asking me some uh, speared questions could help us uh, navigate this process and help people understand what the program's about and what we do in it. So um, put me in, Coach. Well, one of the, um, you asked a key question, which is if we believe in natural recovery as the dominant mode in life, outgrowing addiction is a focus, it's a book, so it doesn't provide hands-on help other than people reading and thinking, what's the purpose of a life process program? And the purpose is to accelerate and support people's own natural recovery process, leaving what could be called the locus of control with that person, encouraging their, empowering them, encouraging their self-efficacy or their sense of agency. And you come to this in a very interesting way, I think. Your professional involvement is with children and teens and families, and it's evident or it should be evident 
that with the child, you're encouraging that person to fully develop, to take ownership of their own lives. You're not starting out with a five or a 10 or a 15 year old saying, oh, you've got a lifetime problem and I'm going to solve it for you. Mm. You're obviously looking at the keyword development. How do you foster their development? And you went from that kind of an interaction, a helping interaction, to becoming involved in addiction coaching. We are dealing with adults, of course, although we are developing a family program, which we'll talk about at some future date. And ironically, perhaps, the process there, as we've just described it with the Life Process Program, is to also encourage one's ownership of one's own life, one's ability to manage their existence, one's own, the person's own self-efficacy, empowering them. And so you, you have a special, I think, skill, perhaps you might call it a gift to offer, in how you generalize from the child and adolescent development and situation to an addiction client. So, so maybe I could start by asking you a question. What's your outlook when you approach a child who uh, it's been, the child's been identified as having some kind of a problem that you're asked to assist with? How do you see that human being, that newer human being, as you approach them to help them? That's a great I, I'm going to plan a flag there, and I'm going to just going to rewind to my own experience because I think it'll give a little bit of context. I had a lot of trouble in school. So for one thing, I'm creative, and I'm highly intellectual. And by that, I don't mean that I'm intelligent per se, but I mean that I'm interested in the flow of ideas and how they lead into new ideas. I love to experiment with conversation and how these ideas work in the real world. I mean, that's why I do a podcast. And you might think that school teachers would appreciate this high level of love for learning and the level of excitement about learning. But in my case, that wasn't that, that wasn't so. On one hand, I could have been labeled highly motivated and built for learning. Um, unfortunately, the things that motivated me weren't what teachers wanted me to be excited about. So instead, I was told that I was distracted and that I had trouble focusing and there was a sense that I was being purposefully disruptive of their canned curriculum. So I could either quit being the way that I was being or that, or there would be a problem. And I simply couldn't stop being me. So I wound up with some labels like ADHD or impulsive, destructive, things like that. So like all high school kids, I, I had that part of my development where I had an identity crisis. But I got it. It got more confusing over time, at least in part because of the way I was treated by educators, and also in part by my own confusion about who I really was and what I valued and how I should act. So over time, partly because of the people I associated with, partly because I felt like it was an emergency that I become someone different than my current self, um, I developed an addiction to using drugs, and I developed addictive relationships with people as well. Long story short there, and to get back to your question, I overcame my problems, including my addictions, and I'm generally successful and I'm a happy person right now. And I learned two critical things from my own experience. One is that I overcame my problems by creating a whole new story for myself, getting back in touch with the things I really valued, the things that truly motivated me, and by rediscovering the people and the resources that I had at my disposal, and which allowed me to pursue these things. And the second thing I learned from it was that through, through, through this course of self-amelioration, I learned that my addiction wasn't a different problem than any of my other personal or developmental problems. It was simply an extension or a symptom of those problems. So that's what I do today. I, I have an ability to, because of my experience, to identify the greatness in kids. So when they're labeled, I can see past that. I can see greatness in kids who might not otherwise see it in themselves whether it's because of labels or because they just haven't found it yet. So I help kids and families see that in themselves and use it to, to contextualize the things that beset them so that instead of panicking about it or falling into existential crises the way I did, they can pursue their interests and passions using their, their own skills and so they can learn what it means to overcome obstacles and gain new skills and new passions, but also 
so that they can learn to just write their own narratives about who they are. So, I mean, I've seen you work. I've read about it. I've actually watched you work a bit with children. I'm aware of some techniques that you use. Um, your, your approach is strength-based. You look at a child rather than as... First of all, you don't label them. You see them as having some kind of a problem with their interactions with the world or school or other people. And you see them some developing, as you did, a self-conception problem. And so your concept, as you just described it, is to help them navigate through those kind of roadblocks, which you do by focusing on their strengths, identifying their strengths often to other people, telling the young person that they do have strengths, and helping them to find a path that they can use to express those strengths. Can, can you, that's my outsider's view of watching your work, can you speak a little bit more about, about how you uh, work with children? I work with kids simply. It almost sounds too easy. I don't know how to say it in a way that sounds profound, so I guess I'll just say what it is. I, I, I work with them to understand who they are. I like to get them to tell me stories about what's important to them and what motivates them. And I simply help them find and latch on to things that are exactly what they told me is important to them and motivates them. Sometimes kids don't get that in the school system. And on, on one hand, it's by no fault of the system or individuals themselves. I mean, it's, it's really hard to have a, a class full of 25 kids have a, a curriculum about something planned and really focus on the essential characteristics of all of the human beings in the class. It's easy to leave kids behind, but the kids are left behind, and, and those are the ones that I work with. And it's, it's no profound, incredible uh, journey that I take with them. It's really just getting to the root of who they are, what they care about, and how to move forward from that. So you emphasize things that I think most people recognize are good counseling and therapeutic skills, you listen, you're non-judgmental, or if anything, you're biased in favor of your client. You're thinking they're good people with abilities who should have a positive outcome. And you're reflective. <clears throat> that is, you're not imposing your values about what you think a good life should be. That was what happened with you. You ask them what they think a good life is. You focus and elicit what their skill areas are and what they want to do and what they can do. And you help them to tell a story that involves them being the star of that life using their values and their skills. It, it's, it's, you're allowing them to tell their story and then to live that life story. There is the truth that life is just something that happens to you, um, that, that it's true to an extent, but it's no more something that happens to you than, than traffic happens to someone driving a car. And so you still get a destination and you still have ways in which you can travel and you still have full control over how you create that journey for yourself. And, and that's what I really try to bring out in kids because when there is a story that lets them hyper-focus on this uh, circular logic that everything that they do is going to be a failure, that's when we get into these patterns that are addiction-like, where you, they, can, they can choose an activity that gets them somewhat of that pleasure or somewhat of that purpose that they seek, but possibly in illusory ways. Because on the other hand, if you're looking for positive moments all the time, if you're optimistic that they will show themselves to you, once in a while they will, and then you can figure out from there how to, how to build upon them. Now, one thing that you have to do in the context that you work is to allow parents, teachers, counselors often, and others to relax, to believe in the child and to allow the child to express themselves in a positive way and to give everybody confidence that this process will come to a good end. And it's funny, 
in order for you to do that, you have to do things like uh, deconstruct labels that have been applied to the child. You have to do that for the child as well. You have to translate things into actionable terms, which I've seen you do. For example, talking about what kind of a setting and what kinds of media the child will learn best in. And you also do it by emphasizing and using positive adjectives to describe the child, which, of course, is fortifying for the child. But it also often has the effect of reassuring parents. So oh, good. My child is capable. My child does have a future where they have also been discouraged. And you might even say counselors and teachers have been discouraged. They've all gotten behind a kind of negative labeling that you have to kind of rip away in order to work with the child. Here's an example. I, I have one that's very recent, and I, I like that you said that. There's um, a narrative that's been written, a, a narrative, a um, reports that have been written about a student that I work with. And I like to look through them, and I like to see what everyone's perspective is to see if I can find any patterns. There's a word that was used over and over, which is uh, rigid and inflexible. And so when I worked, I started working with this kid a little bit, and what I noticed is that that same, whatever it is that is causing people to think that he is rigid and inflexible, it also is true that he is extremely consistent and extremely reliable. He will give you information about exactly what he needs, very reliably, very consistently. So I started putting that, I started almost overusing that when I wrote to his parents about what I noticed in him or wrote to his teachers about what I noticed in him. This caused people, rather than to use this term inflexible or rigid, as if he needed to change who he was, it put a positive spin on the same characteristic so that they, he could get some positive reinforcement for using it in a positive way. What you, rec- what's, you recognize in which people can be fairly clear on with the child, I mean, we sort of all know this, it doesn't pay to get down on the child, it doesn't pay to convince them, uh, to give them labels, although they certainly get a lot of labels. It doesn't pay to convince them that they're headed nowhere, that they're deficient. We sort of all know that. We sort of all know you're not supposed to put a child down um, to emphasize only what they do wrong. And yet, in a modern labeling society, which is very prevalent with young people, they get more and more labels all the time. And at some future time, we can talk about what is it in the world that's causing this. Um, you tear down that barrier and allow, and people welcome it. Parents and teachers like the fact that they can look, recast this child in a positive light. You bring that spin and that gift. Let's take a jump now to how the question I think that we're dealing with specifically in this opening session is, how do you help another human being, in this case an adult, to develop a sense of positive expectation and a purpose in life, which is what we were talking about just now with the child. Right. Giving them a direction forward, a goal that is valuable, that's consistent with their values, and that they feel that they're capable of achieving. Can you translate that paradigm, that helper skill set, into how you talk about and with clients in the life process program. Well, I'm going to turn it back to you in a minute, but I can say that, you know, just like I was talking about why the disease model that we were just trying to debunk a bit is so compelling. Well, it's because you get a story there. Um, You you get to reduce all of this noise that is confusing down to an easily packaged story. But I think the fact that people operate best through narratives doesn't mean that it's best to resort to false stories instead of the truth. So I think in our work with, in my work with kids and in both of our work with adults in the Life Process Program, what we're doing is getting them to think about their own life stories and see for themselves how much power they have to generate the outcomes that they want on their own. And it's usually much more agency than they once believed they had. And not only that, but they learn to in- investigate what's true rather than be limited by things that aren't or labels that aren't true. That 
that story just keeps going. So whether they achieve goals or fall short, clients in the LPP notice that their stories are always developable. What we do is we provide a narrative where they kind of describe their life as it has been, and then we ask them, we, storytelling is a specific part of the life process program. Right. We ask them, well, why don't you look back on your life and emphasize the strengths and put a positive, just how you describe working with a child, why don't you look back in your life and put some positive spin on it? How would you say that you were displaying positive traits or what? Talk about your successes. And then as another part of that storytelling and that narrative, uh, we ask them to project into the future, you know, what would be a good way for this story to evolve. So we, we do use that storytelling technique. And we also use, you describe very much your reflective style with children. And we do that very much in the life process program. Uh, exa exactly, there's an exact link. Before you became involved with the life process program, you ask a child, what do you think a good life is? What is it that you think is valuable? Um, you get them to reflect on their strengths and their good points. And that's something that we do instantly right up front with uh, LPP clients. So you must have felt pretty comfortable shifting from the one group of people that you're helping to the other. I guess that's what inspired us to write this book together is that when I'm concerned with child development, the principles in no way shift. They only shift in age when we're working with adults and addiction programs. So you're talking about right now what it means to people to have a good life, what a good, great life looks like in the future. And there are eight different modules, which we, we could talk about now. I, I don't think we need to, because we'll, we'll speak about them in future episodes. But one of the uh, modules and one of the concepts that we use in LPP is the concept of values. And that sounds pretty cliche in general, but there's, there's a real necessary element of anchoring experiences to what we value. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. People, when we, when you ask the question, for, well, for example, uh, I do a number of exercises with people, and one is to say, uh, you run through this, what's the hardest addiction to quit? And everybody, especially in populations that have had more than one addiction, shout out smoking. And then I say, oh, that's, that's interesting. Has anybody in this group quit that addiction? And you know, depending upon what kind of group you're with, it can be a sizable proportion of the audience, more than half, let's say, in a group that's been very drug involved. But you're generally, by the time I'm talking to them, in some kind of a helper situation, this isn't a therapeutic situation, they themselves are generally helpers, and they've given up the drugs and they realize it's not going to work very well for them to be a counselor with their, if they're smoking. And so, you know, 60% of the group raises their hands. And then I say, oh, did you use a support group or a medical therapy like Shantex or nicotine replacement to quit smoking? And often, I mean, I've been in rooms where, let's say, there are 600 people and 400 have raised their hands about quitting smoking. And never, never, more than a handful, and sometimes zero, raised their hand and said that they've um, quit because of external s support. They've identified this is the toughest addiction they could have possibly tried to quit, and then they also identified that they didn't receive any outside help. And these are people, as I say, as I usually say, have done comparative shopping about addictions. <laughs> So they're they, they're well informed about what's easy and hard to quit, and then I ask this question: What made you quit? And nearly always the answer dials back to some kind of a value. Um, often it's parenthood; they didn't want to be a bad parent. They valued their child, their family. Uh, they valued health. They valued being control of them in control of themselves. They valued not being called an addict or an addicted person, nearly all of the load stars by which they directed themselves away from this toughest addiction 
could be described in terms of being a value. Hmm. Um, we, we're, we'll get also at some point, one of the modules, of course, is what kinds of assets people have, including their skill set and their strengths. Um, and, and as we said, everything is geared towards this feeling of self-efficacy, that you have values and that you're capable of reaching those values using your skill set. And so I, I don't, I'm not there when you talk with a client, but I have reviewed some of your cases. And I know sometimes people are feeling a lack of purpose. And so a, a, a pur purpose is right up there at the top of the value list. It's number one. And so I've seen that you use a process very similar to what you described uh, with a child. Um, you ask them what they think a good life is, what they want to do, what is important to them, and then you list for them what strengths they've already demonstrated, how they've shown the ability to be independent, or how, to, how they've manifested the kinds of skills that fulfill the values that they said are important to them. And it's a reflective process. You're not, in, you don't know the person other than through these sessions. Of course, they might talk to you. That's one option in the life process program. Or they've been filling out written responses to questions like the ones we've been talking about, like what's important to you, what strengths have you had, what do you have, what successes do you have? And you're feeding that back to them. You're not inventing them, you're not searching for them, you're paying attention to what they've said to you, and then you're digesting them is a little bit of a strong word, you're returning to them with this set of experiences and skills to help them come to their own conclusions about how they may set off to follow this purpose. You, you, uh, you, uh, you remember cases like that, I know, because I've seen you write about them. Yeah, well, I, people will ask this, how could it possibly be that just asking people questions about what they already know about themselves helps them move forward in any way? Well, on one hand, it, it puts words to their experiences, maybe for the first time. On the other, we are doing exactly what you said. You start to take in some information about them that they're sharing, and when they hit a brick wall or a problem or have questions, you can return to them the information. And we'll start by asking, you told me X, Y, and Z. You told me you think this is important, and you told me sometimes you use these skills to get this outcome. We can ask them a question. Can you think of other experiences you could create using these skills? Can you think of other things that are important to you uh, that would generate these outcomes that you want? And sometimes just answering that question with the after giving them back the information they've already provided, that helps contextualize things and take a next step in their story or journey. Sometimes they'll still be confused, so it's okay to theorize a little bit. It's okay, I think, to offer some suggestions. So there's one case, um, before we get to the end, maybe I'll just uh, give an example. One case of a guy who he teaches, he's, um, he's an, a double English major, but he has all these problems figuring out what he wants to do in life. One one thing that he told me was that he really hates working for a system, but he's kind of like he's an English major and he does teach, so he feels like that is his livelihood, so how can I get away from that? And I reflected back to him some of the things he told me, which is that, yeah, he doesn't really like working in a system very much. He likes to be his own boss, and he has a lot of skills. He likes to speak but he's kind of introverted, so he likes to speak about things he really knows a lot about. And uh, he likes to have intellectual conversations. So putting that all together, I gave him some advice. Hey, you know, using those skills, what if you kept your day job, like you said was important to you, but you also invented some side work for yourself where you get to be your own boss, using your intellectual skills and public speaking ability. Maybe you do something like a podcast. Maybe you write a book. So we gave all these uh, these list of 
of things he could try, and he's just never thought of it before, but all of those things sounded like good ideas to them. The reason they sounded like good ideas is because I didn't tell him that those are good ideas for him. I suggested that maybe those are some of the things that he could use his skills that he already told me about, um, and, and that would he'd be able to manifest his skills properly in those areas. So I, I think that's one way to help people move forward, too. So let me use two analogies from the detective realm. You're a little bit of a Sherlock Holmes of a person or a person's mind. Um, you're picking out the patterns the way Sherlock Holmes would, but um, all the information, all the data comes from the, Sherlock Holmes would call it the suspect, we would call it the person we're trying to help or the client. But now let me shift to a different kind of a detective, Columbo, <laughs> or for the more literary-minded, uh, the inspector in Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Yeah. Neither of the Columbo's famous for just sort of going, huh, oh, that's funny, but didn't you tell me X or Y? <clears throat> and um, in, uh, in Crime and Punishment, the inspector sort of argues with the guy that he couldn't, in this case, uh, it's not such a good analogy because he has murdered his landlady. <laughs> but he's constantly arguing with the suspect that he couldn't possibly have committed the crime. Um, after all, look, he believes this and he believes that. And it, he gets the man to confess based on his own values. Of course, we're using it in a positive way, but you're reflecting back to the person to allow them to take ownership of ideas and skills that they've already expressed. You are throwing it back in their court. This is, this is, of course, partly the process called motivational interviewing. We very much center it around people's values and strengths. We see it very clearly um, as, a, as a strength building and a therapeutic support, uh, more sometimes than motivational interviewing does. We're, we're more value-oriented. And so in this, in this way, we're answering this detective-like question. As a, in the case of the detectives, they're saying, how do you get people to confess? But what we're doing is saying, how do you get a person to own their own purpose that they've told you, their own story, which they've told you, your, their own values and skill set and their own future. And it resolves, I think, the dilemma of how do you perform <clears throat> non-directive therapy, which has the function of allowing a person to develop a person. We're not religious zealots. We're not selling them on any special set of ideas. We're not even selling them on the idea that addiction is not a disease. We're selling them on themselves and their own worldview and their own life story. And so that's a, a special technique. And I think, I hope listeners can see how that ability to reflect back to strengthening and directing a person towards their own life goals to follow their own lights is a process that carries over from the child development setting to the adult addiction coaching setting. Let me end here. Vygotsky, a child psychologist, he famously said that at play, children are a head taller than themselves. And by this, he means his theory of the zone of proximal development which means that when kids are just left alone to do what they think is interesting and adults or people who could help them otherwise are simply observing, what adults will notice is that kids come to a point where they're so interested in this thing that they can't quite do, but they're trying to figure out how they'll get there. They're so motivated to do this next step of development or to get this next thing they're motivated to get that they will do whatever it takes to get it. That's where an adult can step in and say, would you like a nudge forward? And it's almost like spotting someone lifting weights. It's like you can just get there if you're motivated enough to do it. And I think that's what you offer in the Life Process Program. And in future episodes, we'll help people understand how to 
generate this for people and for themselves um, by doing some of the tricks that we use. As we mentioned, the next episode we'll talk about the importance of values, how to discover and understand values, how to use them to move past addictions and toward a life of meaning and purpose like you've talked about. Is there anything you'd like to add about our sort of pilot episode here and our, our background of what LPP is? Well, it sets up a lot of directions that we'll go in, both with children and with adults, and drawing connections between helping with both of them. Another name that I know you and I both are focused on is Carol Dweck, and who talks about how you, in particular, help a child and reinforce a child um, in a way that allows them to develop what she calls a growth mindset, but which we would call uh, a self-efficacy encouraging one. And, and so we're going to talk about specifics with children and with helping adults uh, that, that embody the kinds of uh, research and techniques that she's evolved. All right. So growth mindset a la Carol Dweck and more in the next episode. We've been speaking with Dr. Stanton Peel. My name is Zach Rhodes. We'll talk soon on the next LPP podcast. You know what I hope? I hope you really enjoyed the show. Thank you so much for listening. And be sure to check out this episode among what's soon to be many other episodes of the LPP podcast beginning December on Blog Talk Radio. If you or someone you know struggles with addiction and you'd like help, go to the Life Process Program. You'll find everything you need to become educated and get started, including a free, confidential, 20-minute consultation with a trained addiction coach. Support the Social Exchange. Support us on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash the social exchange. You will receive rewards by becoming a patron. 25% of all donations go to Families for Sensible Drug Policy. Again, patreon.com slash the social exchange. Thank you to our new patrons, Kathleen Cochran, Talim, Megan McGilloway, Inigo, Chris, Mary Kay Villaverde, Timmy Tucker, Marjorie Israel, John Holt, Lila Ferguson, Michelle, Nancy Holt, Regina Ferguson, Sean H., and Tom Rhodes. That's my father. We'll be talking very soon. First with Emmanuel Spherios on our second Poll the Panel episode, and then again with Kenneth Anderson in the second of what's to be many, 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 many episodes of FSDP Presents. We'll talk soon.